Um, this week, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, vowed to crack down on people illegally crossing the channel in small boats, hoping to start a new life here in the UK. And the Prime Minister called the journeys very bad, stupid, dangerous and criminal. A tougher approach was welcomed by many, but this is a highly divisive and emotive subject. A YouGov poll published this week found that while 49% of Brits have little sympathy with migrants crossing the channel, 44% do. So just what is our moral duty to those making that journey? Here to discuss these difficult issues are Director of the Forum on Integration, Democracy and Extremism at think tank Civitas, Emma Webb. Journalist and author Douglas Murray, who wrote the best-selling The Strange Death of Europe, Exploring Immigration. Refugee and researcher in forced immigration Ahmed al-Rashid, who himself fled Syria in 2015. And senior rabbi Laura Jana Klausner, who has co-led a movement to support refugees. Hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, well, yeah, we'll start with you, Rabbi Laura. Um, we just heard about that poll. It shows how divided we are as a nation. Is, isn't it time to get tough? I think it is time to get tough. But what we need to do is be tough with a clear legal system that enables people to apply for immigration, apply for asylum, which of course different things, so that there's a safe legal route. They can apply for asylum or apply for immigration, very different, abroad. And so they don't have to come here illegally. There is no way that people can arrive here legally and apply for asylum. So yes, it's criminal because the system is set up to block people even asking to come. Then set up a system, set up criteria, and we can say yes or no. So what do we do now? Do we send back the people coming over now? I mean, there were 235 on the 6th of August, weren't there? Yes, that's not actually that many people who are so completely desperate that they would pay money to smugglers in order for them to come. We are talking about extremes and also very, very few people. And it is our moral duty to treat them properly, to look after them carefully, and then to assess their cases. Emma, she's right, isn't she? Don't we have a, a moral duty? There, many people have written an open letter to Priti Patel asking that we, that we don't punish those seeking safety and saying that we do need to show compassion. Do you not agree? Well, I think that um, so the the recent YouGov poll actually showed that 73% of Brits, um, regardless of political party or their you know views on Brexit, believed that the illegal entry issue was a serious problem. So even if people have sympathy with migrants or sympathy with asylum seekers. I think sometimes we think that the thing that makes us feel good and the thing that makes us feel virtuous and the thing that seems most obviously um, most obviously um, moral isn't necessarily the right thing. So um, Rabbi Laura has just mentioned, she said that this is very many people actually coming over. Well, in terms of the amount of money that these uh, traffickers are actually getting, I did a back of the envelope calculation just before coming on air, and it's over 4,000 people since the beginning of lockdown. That's more than 24 million pounds in the pockets of these human traffickers. And this money will be being funneled into other crime on the other side of the channel, which puts the genuinely vulnerable people at risk, while the people who are coming over in the boats are essentially queue jumping and taking away resources from people who might actually need it and would have a legitimate reason to come here. Lots of the people are coming from Iran and from countries that aren't actually at war. Um, and a lot of the failed asylum seekers actually, once they're here, we fail to remove them. Very few people are actually removed. Of the thousands that have come, only I think it's 115 people have actually um, been removed. So I think that we have to be thinking about the, the moral consequences of letting these people come over in the first place okay, and Emma, where that money okay, is going Emma, on the other side of the panel. Well, let, let's bring in Ahmed now, because you made the crossing illegally uh, after fleeing Syria uh, and you now have the legal right to remain. Did you have any other option? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I think um, the, the, the question about legality, legality, if you look at the international law, I do not have any option. If there were any legal ways for me at that time, I would have taken that. But for me, there was no option. The first option for me, you know, to return home, my love time in Aleppo, Syria. Unfortunately, that was not possible. It is still not possible. This is why the vast majority of people like me from Syria, they're still in the neighboring countries. 
Um, um, again, um, there's a situation deteriorated where I lived in Iraq, you know, after ISIS came. And again, um, you know, um, initially many of these countries have an open board, an open door policy. With time, things got really, really hard. And again, if you look, you know, the vast majority of people are living in, in very, very precarious situations. Many people now do not have, you know, uh, right to education, access to education, healthcare. You know, um, right to work, and, and 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 a small percentage of these people have decided to make, um, you know, um, this dangerous journey, and I was one of them. Yeah. So you you were forced to make the, the dangerous journey. Just give us a, a, a brief idea of what it was like. The journey itself was one of the you know most difficult experiences of my entire life. You know, crossing um, the sea uh, with the dinghy, um, you know, women, children, um, you know crammed, you know, packed into these small dinghies, um, sometimes, you know, in the back of lorries uh, with frozen chicken and meat. Um, this is all because there was no legal way for me to, 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 to make the, the, the journey, and I had to resort to this, you know, life-threatening life -threatening and dangerous um, means, unfortunately. Douglas, you've uh, you've written about about this uh, very difficult subject. Why why do you think people would put themselves in danger like this uh, unless they were desperate? Why would anyone do that? Well, it's obvious. I mean, lots of people do it because they're desperate. Uh, lots of people do it because they're desperate for a better life. And what people have found very hard in countries like ours in recent years is to work out the difference between these things. When you say this is a divisive issue, it's true. But it's not just a division between, you know, generous people and mean people or people in favour of... Uh, you know, migration, those against. It's something that goes down the heart of all of us. All of us are torn on this issue because we want to be generous to people who are actually fleeing war and oppression. But we know we can't be limitlessly generous. When I was covering the crisis of 2015, at the uh, entrance uh, points of southern Europe, uh, most of the people I was encountering then were not from uh, uh, Syria, were not actually from the Middle East, but were from sub-Saharan Africa. And I saw for myself then that, of course, you know, sub-Saharan Africa has something like 850 million people in it. A poll last year said at least a third of the people in sub-Saharan Africa would like to move. Do they have a reason to want a better life? Sure. Can Europe, let alone Britain, take in such a number of people? Of course not. So here's the problem, is that this country is generous and the general public in Britain are in favour of helping genuine asylum seekers. But what we have at the moment is this parallel system as well, where if you do jump the queue, if you do get to France and then take the crossing, you can also get in. And there's just an unfairness about that. And, then, and an unfairness uh, towards the British people, who, are, who, as I say, are generous and who pay their taxes and support uh, such people. But also it's unfair to the many other people who are trying to come, that the people who get to the front of the queue, having gone through safe country after safe country, should get, in the end, to stay in Britain. But Douglas, we are a nation based on Christian values, compassion being one. And surely that is how we need to approach this. And as Rabbi Laura points out, there isn't actually a way that people can legally apply. I, th I think, first of all, that's a rather presumptuously simple analysis of Christianity. But Welcome let's, to park me. That, <laughs> let's park that. That's for my worldview. Sorry, Douglas. I'm, I've come from late um, night comedy. <laughs> that's okay. I know. I notice. Uh, but the point is, is that is that what actually, as I, I, I say in the Strange Death of Europe, what's actually going on here is not just you know compassion versus meanness. It's actually, the problem is there are competing virtues. I say it uh, is a case of justice versus mercy. We all feel mercy towards people fleeing oppression. But it's also important to have a thing called justice. And that's not just, just justice towards the people arriving, but justice towards the people of Britain. We can't take in everybody in the world who would like to be here. So it is fair that we have a system that is just, that does not allow people repeatedly and routinely over the years, albeit in small numbers sometimes, but the small numbers grow, to come in and break that just system. Yeah. So, uh, Rabbi Laura, Emma mentioned earlier that she'd worked out the figures that, that these, the people traffickers are making, the amount of money they're making. So it's, it's three to six thousand pounds per person, and there are lots of people trying to come over. I mean, are we? does the current system incentivise people to come over and traffickers to make an awful lot of money? No, the current system totally de, um, de disincentivizes, and it is terrible the number that Emma quoted of 24 million. But there isn't a queue, and I, where I would disagree with Douglas is that there isn't a queue because a queue 
uh, implies that there is a neat system which you can apply. And I absolutely agree with him that the Jewish values, as well as Christian and Muslim, etc., of justice and mercy are vital. But we don't have justice. So I, this is not some fluffy rabbi saying, let's have a bit of mercy. No, I want justice. I want a system that can be uh, clear, that there are criteria, that someone can stand in a queue. So I don't agree, Douglas, that there is a queue. What I think is excellent about his book is that there has to be a proper discussion about immigration, which is different than this system of refugees. And we, if we want to look at a legal system, we have signed on since 1951 and repeatedly renewed in different ways our commitment to people who are fleeing persecution, which is different yeah. than Douglas, is... Uh, immigration. And I met loads of people. I mean, Douglas also, we were both, he went out, we both went out and did proper meeting and research. Lots of people actually from Syria in the jungle in uh, France repeatedly, and they were fleeing persecution. And it is our international agreed justice system, which we signed up to, to look after them. I mean, Douglas, we actually don't take that many of the world's displaced people. We've got, got around 1%, have we? Douglas. And we, we, don't we take in fewer than we can, relatively, than, than we can afford or per head it, in Europe? It depends, it depends what you mean by afford. Uh, many of the countries that you might be thinking have afforded far more, have had a lot of problems as a result of it, thinking particularly of a country like Sweden, for instance. Uh, in fact, this country, there are good reasons, aren't there, why this country hasn't taken in as many people as others. We're a lot further away from certain places, like particularly Syria, than other countries. There's also, of course, um, a, a, a waterway between us and the continent, and all of these things make it harder to get here, as Ahmed very well knows. Uh, the, the, the other issue that's got to be raised in this is that this country views this in the round, and I think this is very important. Britain is the second largest international aid giver in the region of, uh, of the countries around Syria that's been trying to help Syrian refugees. That's because this country's view has been, as, as many others has been, that, and by the way, a lot of aid agencies, if not most, now agree with this, that it's more desirable if a war breaks out, like the tragic civil war in Syria, that people are contained within the countries around the country that has broken civil war in order that when hopefully it stops, they can return more easily to their country. Okay. That's generally agreed to be much more desirable than, say, allowing people to just, you know, break into other countries illegally and go to other parts of the world I, okay, where they Douglas. will not have an easy okay, life. OK, Douglas. Well, that's bring Ah Ahmed in. Um, are you worried um, that things are going to get worse after Brexit? I mean, it's really hard question and I think this is I mean first of all it's a difficult question. I think you will find people who will give you know evidence to both points. But for me personally, uh from the way I look at it as a Syrian, as a refugee, the first thing for me is if you look at this specific debate, it's been framed as if that you know everyone wants to come to the UK. But we, if you look at the the bigger picture, the vast majority of people like me, Syrians and the vast majority of refugees are not in Europe in these other countries. So talking this, you know, to address this specific question, I think it is, again, difficult for me to answer this. It's beyond me. But I think if you look at the, the context of the UK, I think um, from my experience over the past four, five years, it's been quite positive. Uh, Brexit or not, I think one of the probably one of the best things that I've been working on over the past seven, you know, uh, several years has been the resettlement scheme, which gives people, you know, a legal pathway um, to, to come. Okay. to Britain and the UK has been leading on this. So this is something positive that I can talk about right. given the current situation. OK, I, I, mean, I mean, this is a debate that could go on and on. We could do the whole programme and probably next week's programme on it, but I'm afraid we're out of time at the moment. So Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Speak for yourself, though. I, I couldn't. <laughs> you're you're done with it, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Still to come on Sunday Morning Live.